In Hebrews 11.1, 1, we see that faith is confident in what we hope for, an assurance about what we do not see. Another translation says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. When someone once asked Billy Graham to define faith, he said this, faith simply means believing that something is true and then committing our lives to it. Faith is essential to the Christian life. As Ephesians 2.8 tells us, it's by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. Faith, then, is a saving grace, whereby we receive and rest upon Christ for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. It is a sure knowledge and a firm confidence in the promises of God that have been secured through the redeeming work of Christ. Faith is at the heart of the great exchange where God gave up his only son so that whosoever might believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Faith is the means by which we receive the grace of God and it is by grace we are able to have faith. Faith establishes the link between us and God. Now, if I were to sum up every helpful definition of faith I heard over the years, in a nutshell, I would say that faith is a trusting dependence on God. It is F-A-I-T-H, forsaking all I trust him. Faith in God, then, is committing to the things that would lead people to drop everything as the disciples did in order to accept Jesus' invitation to follow him, to live as he lived, to give as he gave, and to love as he loved. True faith is a trusting faith, and a trusting faith is one that goes beyond mere intellectual assent. Trusting faith moves towards a surrender of the will and to a true obedience. It goes beyond just agreeing to a set of beliefs and a submission to live as if those beliefs are actually true. It's the difference between knowing that a bridge over a great expanse or river won't fall apart when you walk, walk across it and then actually taking a step forward. It's the difference between knowing that your parent will catch you when they tell you to jump and then actually taking the leap. This is faith. But have you ever wondered what a great faith looks like? Have you ever wondered what type of faith would astonish Jesus? Like what sort of faith would amaze Jesus to the point that would make him stop and pause to publicly comment on it. Well, if you're able, please keep your Bibles turned to Luke 7, verses 1 to 10, as today we're going to explore what a great faith in Jesus looks like. As Jesus enters into Capernaum, a group of Jewish elders approach him. They tell Jesus that they're coming to him on behalf of a Roman centurion. They tell him that the centurion had a valued servant who is sick. And in Matthew's account, we learn that this servant is paralyzed and was suffering terribly. We learn that the elders were sent to Jesus by the centurion and see that these elders held the centurion in high regard as they tell Jesus that he is deserving of his help. They appeal to Jesus according to the centurion's merits, citing his love for the people of Israel and his support in building the synagogue at Capernaum. So as we see in verse 6, Jesus decides to go with them. Then the plot thickens. As Jesus was approaching the centurion's home, he sends out his friends to intercept Jesus with a message. When they approach Jesus, they share these words from the centurion himself. Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And at this, Jesus is amazed. He is astounded. He's astonished at the faith of the centurion. 
So much so that he turns to the crowd that was following him and says in verse 9, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. It's worth pausing to reflect on what we just heard. If you're familiar with the story, have you ever stopped to ask, what made the faith of this Roman centurion so great that it made Jesus stop in his tracks and comment to the following crowd about how he had not found a faith like the one he had just witnessed? Have you ever wondered what is so great about the faith of the centurion, so great that he is the only person in all the Gospels that gets a response like this from Jesus? Well, at first glance, very little about the situation seems that unique. Here was someone who was desperate to see their servant healed. So naturally, they sought help from someone who is known to be a healer. And Jesus was that healer. Jesus would have been well known in Capernaum, where the centurion was stationed, as it was considered his home base. In fact, Capernaum is mentioned at least 16 times in the Gospel accounts, and Matthew even identifies it as Jesus' own town. Many of Jesus' teachings and miracles took place here. Because of this, the centurion was likely well acquainted with the story surrounding Jesus' miraculous abilities. Further, it was clear that he was engaged with the local community as the Jewish elders comment on his love for the people of Israel and his help in getting the synagogue built. Thus, it's likely that he had heard of Jesus' teachings and the miracles that he performed. In fact, he himself may have been a first-hand witness to the works of Jesus. This means that the centurion's request was grounded in a sense of what Jesus was actually capable of doing. By this point in Jesus' ministry, Jesus had turned water into wine, healed someone of leprosy, provided a miraculous catch of fish, and healed many. In Capernaum alone, he had driven out a demon and healed a royal official son. For the centurion to seek the help of Jesus... It wasn't like seeking to throw a Hail Mary at the end of a game where the quarterback is blindfolded. Instead, it was more like a calculated play where he knew that as long as the quarterback got the ball, it would get into the receiver's hands. What the centurion wanted to ensure was that the ball got into the hands of Jesus by getting the message to him. So when the centurion asked for healing for his servant, he was demonstrating a trusting dependence based on the things he knew to be true about Jesus. And this trusting dependence was evidence in the fact that he believed that Jesus could heal, even from a distance. He did this because at the core, the centurion knew that more than the strength of his faith, it was the object of his faith that really mattered. It's likely, like that, it's likely that he, like many of the others who had come to Jesus, had exhausted every other option. He had searched WebMD for solutions, gone to the local acupuncturist, tried essential oils, scoured his network to see who the best doctors were, and had called everyone who owed him a favor for help. It wouldn't have been a surprise if he had gone to every physician and healer in the area and had them look at the case. But all, he, all, but all he had put his faith in had failed. But when he heard that Jesus was in town, he knew that Jesus was likely the one who could bring about the healing that he so desperately needed to see. And in that moment, he believed that Jesus was who he heard he was and then placed his faith in him. You see, it's not how strong your belief is, but how strong the object of your belief is. It's not the strength of your faith, but the strength of the object of your faith. It's not the force by which we believe, but the power of the force which we believe in. Far too often as Christians, we place the emphasis on the strength of our own faith, thinking that if we just believed harder, that God would meet us in our need. But what we see here is that it's not about believing harder, but placing your belief in the right thing. And this is what the centurion did as he placed his faith in Jesus. The centurion believed that Jesus was able to heal and trusted that if Jesus simply said the word, it would come to pass. This is why he sends people to intercept Jesus as he was approaching the centurion's home. 
In verses 3 to 4, we saw that the centurion first sent Jewish elders to ask Jesus to come. In their plea, they appealed to the centurion's merit, saying that he deserved to have Jesus fulfill his request. They praised the centurion's worthiness because of his love for the people of Israel and his support in building the synagogue. But the centurion himself tells Jesus the exact opposite thing in the message he sends to the to say that in the message that he sends to Jesus as he approaches his home. Instead of appealing to his own worthiness, his own deserving, he says that he does not deserve to have Jesus come under his own roof. While Jesus was approaching, he realized that if Jesus had the ability to heal, then he could heal in any which way he so determined. This is why he simply asked Jesus to say the word. And it is this that astonishes Jesus. This is what astounds him. For this, the centurion was credited with a faith that amazed Jesus. Now, I believe we could actually just stop here and spend time reflecting on all that this means. I mean, think about what it means for the centurion, let alone anyone, to believe that Jesus could heal from a distance with just a word, especially when it would only make sense that a healer would need to be physically present in order to heal. Remember, they didn't have telemedicine back then. He couldn't pull out his iPhone and start FaceTiming. And as far as I can tell, you can't diagnose what you don't see, and you can't treat which you can't diagnose. So for the centurion to tell Jesus that he didn't even need to come to the house and that all he needed was to say the word shows that he believed that, the, that Jesus actually had the authority and the power to heal. Now, I don't know about you, but I sometimes struggle to trust people to do what they, do, to do what they say they will do even in the little things let alone the major things like we're seeing in our passage today. I don't know if you can see this, um, but my pinky is crooked. It wasn't always this way, uh, but when I was living in Korea around the age of 14, I cut it as I grabbed the edge of a metal bookcase trying to make a hard turn running out of a classroom into a hallway. When the doctor told me that the cut had gone deep into the bone and that the tip of my finger was barely hanging on, I immediately asked him if he had treated anything like this before. Technically, I actually cried first, but once I collected myself, this was what I made sure to ask. He assured me that he had worked on many, many cases similar to this. But even still, I had a hard time trusting him. Here was a doctor with years of schooling and experience who promised me that he was going to make sure I didn't lose my pinky. But instead, I couldn't help but question him throughout the entire process. For me, the vast education, the credentials, the experience, and even the confidence the doctor had in his own abilities to handle my case weren't sufficient to release my trust to him. Yet here's the centurion believing that Jesus could heal with merely a word. How much more difficult would that have been? But believing that Jesus could heal with just a word from a distance isn't the only hurdle the centurion had to overcome in faith. You see, in order for the centurion to arrive at this point, he needed to overcome quite a few obstacles. The hurdles he would have had to overcome were both external and internal. They were socially influenced and personally generated. Externally, externally, there were several social realities that would have easily hindered the centurion from placing his faith in Jesus. First of all, the centurion was a Gentile. Just glance at the Bible and you'll see that the divide between Jews and Gentiles to be as wide as the political divide in our country today, which I pray will find some resolution and that the church would contribute to healing instead of further division. The Jews believed the Gentiles to be unclean. Gentiles despised the Jews. Intermingling was not encouraged, nor was it really sought after. Second of all, the centurion was Roman. This meant that he had rights and privileges that were not afforded to all the others under the rule of the Roman Empire. This no doubt created tensions with those who were subjugated to Rome, but didn't possess the same rights and privileges that Roman citizens possess. But this also led to a widespread superiority complex among those who held Roman citizenship. 
Now, before, I, before the pandemic, I loved to travel. In fact, I still love to travel, even though I haven't really been able to. And I've had the privilege of being able to travel to about 50 countries now. And one of the things I've learned in my travels is that there is a power to passports, especially when it comes to returning home. While it often takes quite a bit of time to pass through passport controls in other countries, when you return home, entry is often quicker as more lanes are usually left open just for citizens. Further, when you return home, the only questions you typically hear are, how was your trip and welcome home? But when you enter into other countries, you might be interrogated with questions like, what is the purpose of your trip? How long are you planning on staying? And where are you staying? This is why people often say how nice it is when they return home from their long travels, especially as they breeze through passport control. You see, citizenship comes with certain privileges. Now, beyond being a Gentile and beyond being a Roman citizen, we have to remember that the centurion was also an officer in the Roman military. It was an integral, he was an integral thread in the fabric of the Roman occupying forces. He was, as Black Panther's sister, Shuri might have called him, a colonizer. With oversight over a hundred Roman soldiers, centurions held prominent positions within the empire. And their primary goal was to maintain control through law and order as they occupied co conquered lands. Our centurion not only benefited from the empire, but preserved its dominance through the threat of force. In addition to the usual suspects of pride and unbelief that all of us face, these were just a few of the forces working against the centurion's faith. Yet he had faith despite these things and other, many other things to, to add. What we can conclude just by considering this is that faith doesn't always come easy. Sometimes having faith comes with challenges, but that's what faith demands. Faith demands that we overcome the hurdles to it. That, that's why it's called faith. If there were no hurdles, it would be called something else altogether. Overcoming hurdles is a, is a part of faith. One of the things you have to realize is that the faith of the centurion is an unlikely one. For anyone reading the Lucan account, it would have been an unexpected faith. You see, in Luke 4, Jesus went to Nazareth in order to give a word. Nazareth was Jesus' true hometown. It was the place that he grew up and spent his childhood. And when he told them that he was the fulfillment of Scripture, instead of accepting the word that he gave them, they rejected him, which is why he said that a prophet has, his, has no honor in his own hometown. There in Luke 4, the people of Israel, the people of God, lacked faith, they had no faith. But here in Luke 7, a Gentile demonstrates great faith. And it wasn't just any Gentile, it was a, a Roman centurion. And what we see with the centurion is a faith so great that Jesus commends his faith in a way that he does not do with anyone else, including all those in Israel. Now some of you after hearing of such great faith are built up in your faith. You're nourished, you're encouraged, you're inspired. And if this is you, praise God. I love that your spirits are lifted and that your faith is strengthened. But others of you might experience the opposite. You might feel deflated or down because your faith is nowhere near as great. In fact, some of you feel like your faith has gone cold and is on the brink of extinction or petrification. If this is you, I want you to see something in the text. In verses 7 and 8, as he sends his friends to tell Jesus that he didn't need to come to his house in order to heal, he says, but say the word and my servant will be healed. Now listen to this. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. And I tell that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Here, we see that the, f the centurion is able to grasp faith through the framework of his own experiences. He was a military officer. He knew how authority worked. And as Jesus was approaching his home, he realized that he was appealing to someone with the authority to heal. 
In this, we see that God uses the framework of the centurion's experiences to connect the dots of faith. Faith was forged through the grid of the centurion's understanding. God spoke to the centurion in a way that he could comprehend. If you find your faith, if you find that your faith is fickle or on the edge of failure, I want you to know that God will meet you in a way that resonates with you. He'll speak to you in a way that you can understand. The Holy Spirit will help you to connect the dots of faith. But I also want to encourage you that if you're in a place where you need God to meet you for whatever reason, to be like the centurion and ask God to simply say the word. Ask him to say the word that brought forth all of creation and declared it as good and then declared you as very good. To say the word that tells the oceans to stop and only go so far. To ask God to say the word that stops those who seek to destroy you. To say the word that he knew you in your mother's womb. To say the word that he has plans to provide for you, to make you prosper and to give you hope. To say the word that you are a more than a conqueror in him. To say the word that he is making all things new. To say the word that your story isn't over yet. To say the word that you are his beloved. And to say the word that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. For when he speaks, all that is wrong is made right. All that is upside down is turned right side up. And all that is broken is restored. He is for you, not against you, and is with you until the very end. Amen.